This happened back in 2015 when I used to live in a two bedroom apartment. My roommate had recently moved out, so I was suddenly struggling to pay rent on my own. That's when I was swayed by the thought of renting out my spare room as an Airbnb on the weekends. My parents helped me furnish the guest room, and when I had guests over on the weekends, I would go over to their place and stay with them. Things were fine for a while, until the first time I rented out the room to some guy named Kenny. He was a few years younger than me and looked like an edgy incel with a wannabe rock star haircut. It was clear that he was at least a bit of a creep from the beginning, but at the time I wasn't concerned enough about who I let stay in my home. I knew my profile picture would probably attract a lot of men to the listing, but I didn't really care. I was gone while the guests were there, so nobody could ever create a problem. But Kenny found a way. He would constantly text me strange things like, What kind of soap do you use in the shower? Or, Which bed do you sleep on? It was annoying, but I knew he would be gone in a couple of days or so. But, just when I thought I'd seen the last of him, he booked the next weekend immediately. I rolled my eyes about it, not expecting this to become a routine thing. But this was only the beginning of Kenny being a regular guest. In fact, once he showed up, he was basically the only guest. This meant I didn't have to worry about not getting the rental income, but it came at the cost of having to deal with every unbearable interaction with them at check-in. He got in the habit of showing up two hours early, while I was still preparing the room for him, and he would just sit outside my front door, waiting for me to come out. At 3 p.m. sharp, the actual check-in time, I would squirm out of the door awkwardly and give him the keys, then rush out of there like I had somewhere really important to be. Hey, where are you going? You can talk to me. I'm a nice guy. I didn't look back. I got out of the building as quickly as possible. I didn't know if the guy was mentally ill or not, but I wasn't trying to stick around to find out. But unfortunately, things got more disturbing from that point on. One night, I started hearing things while falling asleep. There would be a noise somewhere in my apartment, making me feel like I wasn't alone. I remember getting up and shuffling through the dark to check my front door. A huge weight came off my shoulders seeing that the door was still locked. I would then go back to bed assuming the noises were coming from the hallway and that I was just getting paranoid because I let strangers stay in my home. After this repeated itself a few times one week, I decided I needed to take a break from the whole Airbnb thing, so I made the room unavailable for a weekend. I still went and stayed over by my parents' place, just to make sure to completely avoid Kenny. I honestly remember feeling refreshed after not dealing with him for a weekend. At around 9pm that Sunday, I made my way home and was excited to have the evening to myself. I locked the door behind me and set my things down, then I went to the bathroom to get ready for bed. And when I flicked the switch to turn the lights on, I could see Kenny standing there, holding one of the kitchen knives. The blood drained from my face as he held it against my throat. You're all mine now. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Please don't do this, Kenny. You can stay here as long as you like. Don't bargain with me. I'm gonna get exactly what I want. I tried to back away, but he closed the distance between us and started to force me backwards, cornering me into my bedroom. There, I tried to scream for help, but it was already far too late. Kenny shoved me onto the bed and forced me down, holding me with one hand and keeping the knife at my throat with the other. All I could do was plead for my life, hoping he would let me go, but he didn't. I was trapped and held captive in my own apartment with a monster. I continued trying to get away, but Kenny wasn't and budging, holding me against my will. After several horrendous excruciating minutes, Kenny was done. He got up and began to rob me of my phone and other valuables, just for good measure as he bolted out of the front door. When I was able to collect myself enough to get help, I had to get out an old iPad and use it to contact my parents so they could call the police for me. I sat in the corner of my bedroom armed with a knife as I waited for my parents and law enforcement to arrive. 15 minutes felt like 15 hours as I waited in constant fear. 
not knowing if the police would show up in time or if Kenny was going to break into my house again. When they finally arrived, the cops searched the area and were unable to find Kenny. However, it wasn't hard for them to find him. They arrested him at his apartment the very next day. They knew who he was from his Airbnb profile which had all of his information. Over the course of the investigation that followed, it was discovered that Kenny's obsession with me ran deeper and went on for much longer than I had ever thought. He made a copy of my key early on and was using it to sneak into my apartment. He had been watching me sleeping and changing and other sick, perverted things like that for weeks. All this time, knowing that Kenny was making all those sounds at night just sickens me to my core. I can only help to think that, when I made the room unavailable on Airbnb for the weekend, it caused him to have a psychotic meltdown and do what he did. I wasn't okay for a long time after that. I could barely even speak for days. And it's it's taken me this long to discuss it publicly. I broke my lease on that apartment and moved back in with my parents, and I've been living with them ever since. This story was inspired by a case that happened to a 29-year-old woman returning to her Airbnb from a New Year's Eve night out in New York. The suspect hid in her bathroom and then held her at knife point upon her arrival. It was alleged that he had copied her keys to the Airbnb prior to the whole ordeal. Just goes to show how a harmless outing can turn dangerous real quick. It was around January 2016 when it happened. I felt lonely since I had been single for a long time, and despite the advice of my family and friends, I went on Match.com to meet someone who could finally make me feel whole again. As cheesy and small-minded as it may sound, I just wanted to spend my Valentine's Day with someone special instead of keeping my eyes glued to the television all day while munching on some Cheetos all by myself. After browsing every profile, I finally stopped looking when I found Emma. Everything about her was attractive. She was definitely my type. At that moment, I felt she was the perfect match. So, with no time to lose, I messaged her immediately, hoping she wouldn't give me the cold shoulder. Hours passed, making me feel edgy, but the wait was worth it. When she finally replied, my heart skipped a beat, and we have kept in touch ever since. We called each other day and night, talking about everything and anything, and as the weeks passed, I felt we had grown closer. So. Two days before Valentine's, we decided to meet up. Of all the fancy stuff going through my head, taking her to a hotel was the best choice. It meant good food and a luxurious room, but the most exciting part was yet to come with her and I on the bed. So, I checked in a day earlier, intending to spice things up a little as I set up the room to create the perfect atmosphere. The following night, Emma was set to arrive. I'm not going to lie. I was nervous as hell, as if it was a first date all over again, but I didn't want to back out now. So, I gave her the details, including the hotel I was at and the room I was waiting in. At first, I was afraid she'd be under the impression that I was desperate, but when she told me on the phone that she was on her way, it boosted my confidence. About half an hour later, I heard a knock on my door. I took a deep breath and opened it, expecting to see the attractive woman I saw in the photos on Match.com. However, I was disappointed when she looked <gasps> subpar, totally different from the pictures I had seen. She wore a sleeveless shirt and a short flashy skirt with a bulging belly, and dark round circles around her eyes, making her look like a zombie. Moreover, her hair was disheveled and greasy, like she hadn't washed it in days. She was a freaking catfish. I couldn't believe I was being scammed, but despite my dissatisfaction, I was so desperate to be with someone on Valentine's Day that sleeping with her was my only chance. We had a little chat where she told me how thrilled she was to finally meet me in person, and that I was more handsome in real life than in the photos. I wished I could say the same thing about her, but I held back and decided not to comment on her physical appearance, knowing she'd leave me. <gasps> then, as I was about to give her her Valentine's present, her phone rang, and when she picked it up, I heard her say, Yeah, he's here, sitting next to me. I felt my throat dry up. My muscles stiffened. I looked at her with confusion, wanting to ask what was happening. Um, Emma, wh who was that on the phone with you? I said as my voice cracked. She didn't say a word, 
She only stared at me with a blank expression. Then, suddenly, her vigor and interest in me vanished, and I could tell that something was wrong. I just couldn't pinpoint what it was exactly, but then I saw the most disturbing, most horrific thing I have ever saw in my life. A masked man barged in the room, armed and dangerous, saying, Get down on the floor, now! I kneeled down with my face touching the ground, sweat pouring from my body as I raised my hands to surrender. Stop, stop, please let's talk about this. I didn't do anything wrong, just let me go. Shh. Lower your voice. The sooner you cooperate, the sooner we'll be done with this. Emma scowled. I began to tremble uncontrollably, complying with everything they said as they threatened me to get into their vehicle parked in the back. Then, as we walked to the parking lot, the man said under his breath, Don't try anything funny. You got that? This isn't the first time we've dumped a dead body. I swear I couldn't breathe. And even when I saw many people pass by, they were unaware of what I was going through. With no other option, I got into the vehicle, and the couple gave me a hell of a ride. The masked man drove so fast that I thought we would crash at any moment. What do you want from me? I, I don't have much. I, I, I swear. Shut up. One more word from you, and your family will see you on the news. I was afraid my life was going to flash before me. I might have peed my pants, convinced there was no way to escape. <laughs> then, with every chance they got, they forced me to withdraw money from several banks around the city. It was crazy. My head was spinning. I didn't know when, if, or how this nightmare would end. I just wanted to go home. I didn't care if I was alone. Anywhere but here was better. Then, after the sixth <laughs> bank, they made me strip to my underwear, which I hesitated at first. But when they threatened to hurt me, I couldn't say no. And after giving them what they wanted, they kicked me out of the vehicle in the middle of nowhere. It was so dark that I couldn't even see the path I was trekking. There were no light posts nor glowing street signs to give me direction. I was lost, but at least I was alive. Since then, I couldn't look at Valentine's Day the same again. I deleted my profile on Match.com and decided to meet people the right way instead of going online. I didn't know that wanting someone so much could lead me so close to death. Now, whenever it was Valentine's Day, I just spend it at home alone, keeping the doors locked and the house secured. The story was inspired by a real-life case that went down on Valentine's Day of 2016. The male and female shown here were the alleged culprits. The animation pretty much sums up the whole ordeal in a nutshell. The assailants have been accused of kidnapping and robbery, which is punishable by 10 to 20 years in prison. <laughs> this story happened back when Toy Story was trending. Everyone at school owned a Sheriff Woody or a Buzz Lightyear and kept raving about how they could swear their toys were coming to life when they weren't around. I wanted one so bad, but everyone knew my family couldn't afford it. All I could do was watch from the corner alone as the other kids played with their toys, always making fun of me and leaving me out. Hey loser, do you really not have a single toy from Toy Story? No, I, I do. Then where is it? It's at home. Yeah, right. Prove it, bring it tomorrow, and if you don't, me and my buddies are gonna have to beat you up for being a lion loser. Got it? Yeah, I, I got it. I'll bring it tomorrow. <laughs> no you won't. Bring your mom instead. My dad said he saw her at work last night. Looking pretty good, he said. You know, if your mommy even loved you, she'd let you have a little bit of all that money she makes at the club, but I guess she doesn't. That's sad for you. No, I have an, allow an allowance. Aww, look at him crying. What a wimp. When the teasing gets bad, all I can do is ignore them and act like they weren't there. But after school, I was sick to my stomach, knowing that my bullies would make good on their promises to beat me up if I didn't bring the right toy to school the next day. The only problem was that I didn't have one. I lied and I now had to get one, but there weren't many places I could go to on my walk home from school. However, there was this one cheap off-brand corner store that I'd walked past a hundred times. I didn't think they would have what I was looking for, but I had no other option. I went inside and started to look around all the shelves, but of course all I found at first were the usual convenience store snacks and drinks. After I was lurking and not buying anything for a few minutes, the cashier started to follow me around the store with his eyes. Can I help you with anything, chief? 
I nervously shook my head no and walked away to hide from him behind the shelves. As I walked closer to the back of the store, I saw a dusty old shelf that had an unusual selection of antique looking trinkets and knickknacks. I was too young to question why a convenience store would have such things, but I was too distracted to care because I had found what I was looking for. There was a Sheriff Woody doll on one of the shelves that was still in its original box. In fact, it was a little creepy looking, but it was still the only thing remotely Toy Story that I found. So I brought it up to the cashier. That'll be $20, kid. Uh, I, I don't have $20. I, I only have five. That's not enough, kid. Can't you give me a deal? This is my lunch money. Please? I'm not gonna bargain with you, you little brat. Now put that thing back and buy something that's less than five dollars and get the hell out of here. That's when I took the woody and bolted out of the door. I ran until I got inside my house, where I put the box on my dresser, facing my bed. I felt terrible for stealing, so I left it and stayed out of my room for the rest of the evening. Then, to distract myself from my worries, I watched TV with my mom in the dark of the living room until she had to go to work and told me to go to bed. But... When I got up from the couch, I saw the woody box facing me on the floor of the living room. I never told my mom about it because I didn't want her to find out that I stole, but it seemed like she knew about it and just left it there. I grabbed it and carried it back up to my room, putting it back on my dresser. I didn't think anything of it as I went to the bathroom to take a shower. Yet, somehow, when I pulled back the curtain, the woody box was in the middle of the bathtub. <laughs> I freaked out and screamed, taking the box and bringing it back into my room. I racked my brain trying to figure out how it was possible. This time, I made it face the wall. Then I ran to my bed and pulled the covers over my eyes, completely forgetting about showering or brushing my teeth. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before curiosity made me peek out from under the covers. But I was relieved to see that it hadn't moved. Yet as I tried to close my eyes for sleep, I got this nagging feeling in my stomach. I looked one more time to see that the box had turned around, facing my direction. I pulled the covers back over my eyes and froze, convinced I was going crazy. I just wanted the doll to stop moving, but it was like a scab I couldn't stop picking. I had to keep looking. I peeked over the covers again. <gasps> And now the box was open, and Woody was peeking over the edge, staring right at me. I was shaking uncontrollably. I knew it was pointless to pretend I was asleep. I knew that thing had to be alive. There was just no other explanation. So, I looked again, and there he was, sitting on the edge of my dresser, just smiling. STOP LOOKING AT ME! I ran over to the dresser and snatched him from the ledge. Then I stuffed him back in the box, and then jumped back into the shelter of my bed. From there, I could see the doll all tangled up with the packaging inside the box. It looked so uncomfortable. <sighs> I laid back down for just a second, and right as I did, I heard the box tip over. I quickly looked back, but Woody was gone. The box was on its side wide open, knowing he was loose in my room. I didn't feel safe enough to lay down. I sat up, trembling, looking all over for him, but there was no sign of him until... <laughs> That's when a large, freakishly huge Sheriff Woody appeared at the foot of my bed. He grabbed onto the edge and hunched over me, twitching as I crawled back against the headboard, petrified. You've got a me! <laughs> this story was inspired by a viral video of a Toy Story Woody, apparently moving inside a box. The footage was taken at a toy store, beside a toy shelf containing the Woody doll. Here you can see the Woody allegedly moving on its own. There hasn't been anyone to debunk if this was legit or not, but from the looks of it, it looks pretty eerie to say the least. <laughs> Today marks the one year anniversary when my granny and grandpa went away without saying goodbye. My parents told me that they were both doing just fine and that they missed me and my little brother very much. They allegedly went off for a vacation, but they never ended up coming back. I was sitting in my room coloring when I remembered that it was exactly a year ago that they left. But right as I started missing them all over again, I heard my parents crying downstairs. 
I knew they had to be sad as well. I wanted to console them, so I left my room and headed downstairs to see them in the living room. Yet, when I was halfway down the stairs, I was curious and I knew they wouldn't talk about grown-up stuff if they knew I was there, so I stopped and listened. Oh, but how are we going to break the news to the poor little girl? I don't know, my darling. Maybe she's old enough now for the talk. <gasps> Absolutely not. Surely her sweet, innocent heart cannot take such, such... Oh, it just isn't right. <laughs> I'm so sorry it has to be this way. If there was any other way I could change this cruel world we live in, you know I would. Yes, I know you would. In fact. I've decided they could take me next! No, I can't live without you. Besides, you know they take us by pairs. You know what we have to do. No, honey, please don't say it. We must. It's the only way we can survive. We have to give up George and Pepper. For us. No! No, 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 no! That would be a selfish thing to do! To let those monsters sacrifice them before us! You stupid old hog. We can make new piglets if we want to, but we have to be alive! Call me a hog again, you sick, dirt gobbling swine! What the hell is the matter with you? What kind of parrot are you? Well, well, well. I may take part in a bite of dirt from time to time, but I know where your tongue has been, mister. At least I don't stick my tongue up mine. Oh. Daddy, what's going on here? Why are you fighting? Uh, Peppa, my darling. Your father and I are having a grown-up discussion. You should go back up to your room. No, let us stay. Why don't you explain to her everything you just told me? Well, um, I will. You see, this isn't easy to say, but... But? But your father wants to... No, don't put this on <gasps> me, you stinking pork chop! Fine! Peppa, your father and I are sending you and your brother off to be slaughtered this year. <gasps> the room got quiet. Mummy and Daddy stared at me blankly as I gradually understood what Mummy had just said. I was naive, but not stupid. I remembered what happened to Granny and Grandpa, and I heard everything Mummy and Daddy said. I knew what it meant. <clears throat> Peppa dear, go get your brother George. We didn't want you to, to, but look, it's time for you to, okay? Just, just listen to Daddy. Yes, Daddy. I walked away, trembling and choking on the lump in my throat. But I made my way up the stairs and went inside George's room, where he was playing with his toys without a care in the world. Suddenly, just looking at the innocence of my little brother made me feel like a grown-up, like I had to take care of him. Shh! Don't say anything, George. Just listen. Mommy and Daddy have gone insane. They're trying to get rid of us. We have to hide right now. Come on, let's go. They're gonna find us in here. I figured the one place Mommy and Daddy wouldn't expect us to hide in was their own bedroom, so we squeezed underneath their bed. Peppa Pig, what's taking you so long? Oh, shut up. They've gone and hid. Why didn't you go up with her? I could hear them start to fight again, wailing and screaming at each other and yelling all sorts of awful things. They stormed up the stairs and started tearing apart the bedrooms looking for us. I could hear everything being destroyed as Mommy and Daddy became more and more like wild animals. I know it's only because they didn't want to be sacrificed that they acted this way. And in some way I understand it. But I still can't fully believe how quickly they turned on us. But I only had a moment to think before they barged into the room. You little brats better come out of hiding right now, you hear me? They were just inches away. I was sure we'd be found. But then, something changed. <gasps> Shh! Stop it. Do you hear that? It was the sound of someone breaking down the front door downstairs. It's him! Hide! Suddenly. Mommy and Daddy were scrambling for a place to hide just like us, but they didn't have the same luck. They were so big that no matter how much they scuffled around trying to be quiet, there was nowhere in which they could possibly hide from what was coming. And of course, it wasn't long before that man, the butcher, started making his way up the stairs. Here, piggy, 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 where are you? Come to daddy now, my little bacon bits. I want some freshly bled pork chops. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I can hear and smell you. And now all that's left to do is taste you. <laughs> that's when the butcher appeared in the doorway, armed with a cleaver and a rope. Mommy and daddy squealed when they knew they were trapped. Poor little George and I were hiding there the whole time, watching everything, unable not to hear the unforgettable sounds of the utmost suffering. Papa George, help us please! We're sorry, we were just... Hmm, I wonder who this Peppa and George could be. Oh well, 
I've got my pair of piggies for now. I'll just have to come back for them next year. <laughs> Finally, the mad butcher was then finished with his business and dragged mommy and daddy away, leaving me and George under their bed to finally understand why a pig never wants to grow up. This story happened a few weeks ago when my girlfriend and I wanted to celebrate our two-year anniversary together. So, there was no better way to do it than to go on a short getaway, far from the busy city life we were used to. I searched for a few houses on Airbnb and settled on a big three-story home on the outskirts of town resembling a cottage. It was the perfect place, and so, I showed the photos to my girlfriend and she was on board with my selection. According to the app, the house was owned by an older gentleman that looked to be around his 60s. There was a brief set of rules that he put in the description stating that we could only access the bottom two floors, leaving the top floor off limits. My girlfriend and I didn't make a fuss about it as we were content with the price and what we saw in the photos. Nonetheless, we dropped by the following week. Like all the Airbnb check-ins, we took a brief tour of the house. Everything seemed as advertised in the photographs. The second floor was where we could find the bedroom and bathroom, while the bottom floor was where the kitchen, living room, and dining room was. Since there were only two of us anyway, this was worth it even though the door to the third floor was locked. After all, having two floors to ourselves was more than enough. On the first night, we simply hung out and watched some television. I remember it being around 1 in the morning when we were just about to call it a night, but right as we were about to climb into bed, I could hear the sound of footsteps creaking somewhere beyond the living room. The sound seemed to be emanating from upstairs. I shook my head, unsure whether I was just hearing things, but when I turned to face my girlfriend, I could see that she heard it too. So, to put our minds at ease, I left my girlfriend in the living room as I headed upstairs to check where the sounds may have come from. I remembered hearing it again, but much more vivid. It seemed like the sounds were coming from the floor above me. I headed for the locked door on the third floor, taking a deep breath as I walked through the pitch darkness. When I found the knob, I wrapped my fingers around it and began yanking it frantically. But no matter what I did, it wouldn't budge. It was totally locked. What the hell are you hiding in here? I whispered to myself. Then, to my surprise, the footsteps immediately stopped. I knew I must have scared off whoever it was up there. When I went back to my girlfriend and explained the ordeal, she instantly messaged the owner, alerting him about the strange noise. About a minute later, the owner responds, insisting that this happens all the time since there were a lot of raccoons in the area. So, to avoid ruining the special occasion, we decided to take his word and enjoy the rest of the night. The following night, we watched some TV again without any interference. This time, no odd sounds were coming from the third floor. However, as we flipped through the channels, a video of an empty room with night vision was displayed on the screen. At first, I thought it was just one of those reality shows or perhaps a lame horror movie. So, we quickly changed the channel after that. Now, we were watching a house from a first person's point of view, like the camera was near the doorbell. It got us thinking about how bizarre it was for some of these channels to share similar features to the home we were in, and that's when we started putting two and two together. We flipped through the channels again and were shocked to see surveillance camera footage all over the house, but the most appalling video of them all was an aerial view of the toilet. We couldn't tell if it was the same bathroom as ours, so I began recording with the camera on my cell phone and waited in the living room while my girlfriend headed to the washroom. As she made her way upstairs, I could literally feel my heart beating out of my chest. I didn't want to believe it, but my fear became a realization when I saw my partner on the TV as she entered the bathroom. My heart sank in utter terror. It became evident that the footage we had seen was of the house, which the Airbnb owner must have set up. All of our intimate moments were recorded, our most private thoughts and possessions exposed. So, we immediately packed up and left, 
hoping no one was waiting to ambush us outside the house. As we ran toward the car, we stuffed our luggage in the back seat and drove off. However, before leaving the property, I could swear seeing someone peeking from the top window behind the curtain. That's when I suddenly remembered the creaking noise from the previous night. All this time, I couldn't help but realize that the Airbnb owner must have been living on the floor above us, surveying and recording our every move. What turned out to be a seemingly innocent getaway turned into a horrific nightmare. I felt violated, abused, taken advantage of, reluctant to escalate the matter. My girlfriend asked me to complain to Airbnb instead of the police. When I asked her why, she said she didn't want random men from the station or investigation team to see all the private stuff we had done during our stay. Hence, I granted her request and complained to Airbnb. However, after spending hours explaining to them, it didn't seem like we were getting anywhere. So, we went around in circles only to receive a full refund and an update telling us that they had banned the owner from using the Airbnb service. Meanwhile, he wasn't incarcerated because he and his lawyers claimed it was only meant to be a prank and that my girlfriend and I had no physical injuries. My girlfriend was satisfied with the outcome, but for me, I wanted to see him behind bars. Since then, I'd sweat and tremble whenever I saw a camera, forever traumatized by the experience. There are dozens of cases on the internet where creepy peeping toms were caught hiding hidden cameras inside their Airbnb residences, but this story in particular was inspired by two disturbing Airbnb cases that are just downright terrifying. The first case was a video of a couple shocked to find that one of their TV channels was showing an aerial view of a toilet, happened to be the same one in their Airbnb home. Whether the video is legit or not, the thought is horrific. However, the second case is what really takes the cake. A man hears noises at night in his Airbnb stay. When he checks the air vent to find out where the sounds were coming from, he sees a secret room hidden inside there. Airbnb has since been contacted for comment. I'm a regular customer at Burger King, always enjoying what they have to offer in their menu. Since the food quality had never ceased to amaze me, I had become loyal to this fast food restaurant for many years. Fortunately, one of the branches was situated near my home, making it a 10 minute walk and convenient to get my Burger King fix. I didn't care if my diet revolved around Burger King, and although I enjoyed their Whoppers, it was their chicken tender crisp sandwich that won me over. I was free to eat as much as I could from Burger King since my husband was rarely home to cook a nice homemade meal, but I never complained as I wasn't the best cook myself. In fact, I've always admired his hard work, and with him being away most of the time, I could get away with my obsession from Burger King since no one was around to reprimand me. So, it was a window of opportunity I couldn't refuse. I would always tell myself that going for a walk as I headed to Burger King was the best way to burn off calories. But deep down, I knew it was pointless, as I would quickly get them back from eating BK all over again. But little did I know at the time that things would drastically change. I was familiar with all the employees working for the Burger King branch near my place, so if a new guy came along, I'd know instantly. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but I felt shivers running down my spine as I glanced at the creep smiling at me as he stared. Then, when I looked across the counter, I was distraught to see that most of their former staff had been replaced. Nonetheless, a change of staff wasn't enough to push me away. I ordered the usual from the creep despite my reluctance, and even when I tried to avoid negative thoughts, he rubbed me the wrong way. Hi. I said, unable to look him in the eyes, keeping myself fixated on his name tag. Then I gave my order. Well, Brian, I'll have a chicken tender crisp to go, please to go. Are you sure? He replied. Yes, to go. I said, to go sit at the table? I didn't know if this weirdo was intentionally joking or not, but he was definitely making me feel uncomfortable, so I told him. I'm sorry, but I'll be taking it home. Thanks. There's no place like home like Burger King, <laughs> he said as he blankly started staring towards my chest. 
I then placed a few crumpled up bills on the counter and waited elsewhere. A few minutes later, he handed over my order and I immediately got the hell out of there. For a week or two, I couldn't stop the urge to order my favorite sandwich from Burger King. And unfortunately, all the other branches were miles away, a bit too troublesome for me to visit. So, even if I had to see that creep repeatedly, it was something I could endure as long as I had a bite of that tasty sandwich. Then, as the weeks passed, I began experiencing stomach pains that were a bit more severe than the ones I had encountered before. However, I was incredibly stubborn. My husband tried talking me out of it, but I still didn't listen. I kept trying to find other scapegoats to avoid putting the blame on Burger King, but the pain in my stomach only worsened. Then, that's when a thought came to mind. Suddenly, images of that creep appeared in my head, reminding me of how he was hitting on me the other time. So, I suspected that this particular employee was behind this. He must have done something to my sandwich, taking a toll on my health. I was so mad that I told my husband about the creep. Initially, I didn't want him to know, afraid I would forever be banned from buying my favorite meal. But then, I urged him to accompany me to the restaurant to meet the manager and complain about the creep. However, my husband shook his head, telling me it wouldn't be wise since I didn't have any evidence to prove my statement. So, one night, my husband and I decided to do a little investigation of our own. We both dropped by the Burger King, where I had ordered the same sandwich with the creep serving it to me. Hi, I'll have a chicken tender crisp to go, please. He snickered and said, What the hell happened to your radiant glow? You seem rather sluggish and pale today. I ignored him, giving him the payment and putting my sandwich in the bag. Then, I sat beside my husband in the restaurant, took out the sandwich, and began inspecting it. Then suddenly, my partner's eyes grew wide as he said, What the hell is this? It seemed like something was moving across the meat. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief, thinking we were imagining things, but we weren't. Upon taking a closer look, we could see about a dozen slugs in it. I felt sick to my stomach. I wanted to throw up all this time. Knowing that I was consuming slugs made me start to act irrational. My husband tried calming me down, but even he couldn't control himself any longer. That's when he went into a fit of rage and started trashing the restaurant, tossing garbage cans and emptying the straw dispensary all over the place. Then he went to the counter and grabbed the creep by his collar saying, How dare you put slugs in my wife's sandwich, you piece of shit? The creep then started started to act oblivious to what was going on, saying, Sir, I have no idea what you're talking about. I can tell my husband became more irritated as the man replied without a tinge of remorse. I could tell my husband was itching to deck the guy in the face, but he was somehow able to retain himself. I remember seeing most of the other customers getting up to leave, having lost their appetite after hearing what my husband said to the creep. I then tried to reason out with the manager, but he ended up siding with the bastard employee and kicked us out for causing a public nuisance. Me and my husband were convinced the manager was either in on it, or he was afraid of the damage this would cause to Burger King's reputation. So, we had no choice but to report the incident to the authorities, where we handed them the slug-infested sandwich as our primary evidence. The cops promised to get back to us soon, but as the weeks passed, there was still no news about its progress. Since then, I hadn't heard about the creep or the slugs. This story was inspired by a story that happened at a Burger King branch at Priestgate, Darlington. A young woman discovered a slug in her chicken tender crisp sandwich and accused the fast food restaurant of ignoring her complaint. A spokesperson has since stated that they have begun preliminary investigations on their food management procedures. Upon searching for a follow-up, it seems like the restaurant has permanently closed down. never alone. Although I was Andy's favorite toy, he had many other toys to keep me company whenever he was away. It was so rare to find us carefully displayed on shelves, and even after a good scolding, Andy would leave us scattered on the floor. One day, amidst the precariousness, my voice raised against a toy threatening to take this hot broad amongst them all. Her name was Jessie, and she always dressed like me, but the delinquent would always accuse me of being irrational and insane. It happened very often. He 
would constantly flirt with her, apparent to everyone he liked Jessie a little too much. Buzz, you don't understand. She doesn't like science or space or guys that dress up in astronaut attire. Shut the hell up, Woody! You're not the only one who has a Woody around here! So get your ego in check! She's the only broad amongst us! So may the best man have her! She don't want you. You're no good. The cowgirl needs a cowboy. She's got a friend in me. So piss off and go after someone like Babyface over there. As we argued back and forth, all the other toys circled us, whispering their thoughts to one another. Then, suddenly, the floor beneath us rumbled. And as we all braced ourselves, the door swung open, prompting us to freeze. Seconds later, a giant teen came marching into the room wearing his favorite green shirt and denim shorts. As he surveyed the floor, he crouched down and picked me up along with Buzz, suspiciously grilling us with his face up close. What was going through his mind, I wondered. It didn't seem like he wanted to stay around and play, so I admit his presence made me a bit nervous. Then, under his breath, Andy said, Is my mind playing tricks on me? I swear I heard something coming from this room. It must have been a rat or something. Then, his eyes scanned the room a bit further, before he finally gave up thinking about it and left. He sure picked the perfect time to interrupt. Buzz grumbled. Hey, Jesse is one thing, but don't you ever talk about Andy like that. Look at you, Woody. Would you stop sucking up to him? Whether you like it or not, Andy will give us up at some point. Besides, he probably bought us off eBay or a garage sale. How dare you, you piece of crap! Enraged, I moved my ragdoll body towards Buzz, pinning him on the floor as I slammed my fist on his helmet as hard as possible, causing it to crack. <laughs> do you call that a punch, Woody? I bet Bo Peep can do a lot better than you do. And the fight escalated, prompting some of the toys to cheer for their best bet, while others cowered underneath the bed, afraid Andy would return. And as some of them suspected, Andy rushed back in, the look on his face suggesting he thought we were all moving around. But as the toys were motionless on the floor, I hoped he would let this pass and go about his day outside. Unfortunately, it was no longer the case. His brows furrowed as he picked me up. He said, I know you're making all that noise. You think I'm stupid? It was enough to shake my entire body, but I didn't budge. I had to remain as lifeless as a toy, because even though Andy was my best friend, he was never supposed to know. Furious, he threw me to the far end of the room, where I hit the wall before I ended up on the floor, still silent and immobile. Fine, have it your way. Andy hollered as he stomped his feet on the floor and walked out of the room. The blow was so powerful that it knocked me out cold. Hours later, when I woke up, I noticed the other toys avoiding me. Why are you all looking at me like that? It's not my fault Andy came back. You should all be looking at Buzz. I couldn't understand why everybody turned their back and ran away like they'd seen a monster. It was a nightmare. I was respected and adored by all these guys, and now it felt like I was their number one enemy. It gave me the impression my face was deformed, looking like a deranged toy giving everyone the creeps. So, I gradually approached Bo Peep for comfort. Hey, I didn't mean for any of this to happen. If there's anyone who'd understand me, that's you, Bo. I thought she'd take my hand and console me, but all I saw was the horror in her eyes before she ran and left her three sheep behind. Screw you! I liked brunettes more than blondes anyway! I screamed like I never had before. Then, with all the fire within me burning, I charged at Buzz, clawing and chewing at his glass helmet. I got Got you right where I want you. <laughs> and just so you know, you've never had a friend in me. Stop it, Woody. What's gotten into you? This isn't you. Get away from me. The fear in Buzz's eyes was satisfactory. I had never seen him with that look on his face before. So it felt like I had won, dominating him entirely. Some other toys tried to gang up around me like I was some kind of wild animal, but it seemed my gaze was enough to push them back. I pounded his head constantly, nearly bursting a hole through it, when suddenly I was yanked by something enormous. Then, when I looked behind me, I saw it was Andy, his grin sinister and wild as he said, I knew it! I knew it all along! You were alive! I knew you were alive! I knew you were alive! 
Then, everything happened so fast after that. He gripped me hard, stuffing me inside a cardboard box and filling it with newspaper, which he taped shut at the very end. Moments later, I could hear Andy say something like, This is perfect. Woody's gonna make someone's birthday or Christmas worthwhile. I'll make sure of it. <laughs> I was so exhausted that I passed out. Then, when I woke up, I was no longer in Andy's room. I was still in the box, except it was open. I could recall looking up at a pink ceiling and had no doubt it was a girl's room. So, as I crawled out of the box, I saw a bunch of Barbie dolls staring at me with a condescending gaze that then turned to a look of fear that would be etched into my memory for as long as I lived. Who the hell are you? And what are you doing in our room? Hey, I can explain! There's no reason to be terrified, I swear! I tried reaching out to them, but they all wanted to avoid me. Why so serious? You've got a friend in me! This happened several years ago around the holidays, which was also my girlfriend's birthday at the time. I wanted to do something romantic for her and get us a nice place to stay at for a few days as a present. It was a good idea in theory. Having a relaxing getaway with just the two of us in the middle of all the holiday traveling and family visiting. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. My first mistake was not booking far enough in advance. By the time the idea came to mind, it was already December and everything was sold out. When I didn't have any luck with traditional hotels, I resorted to checking Airbnb. There weren't many Airbnbs available either, but I eventually came across one that was a cottage type, kind of out in the woods. It didn't have a good rating, and the host was this mid-40s decrepit looking male, but overall he seemed harmless, and it was the only option I had. So out of desperation, I booked it. Fast forward a couple weeks later, and it was my girlfriend's birthday weekend. When we finally checked in the Airbnb retreat, the first thing we noticed was just how big it was. Aside from that, I thought it wasn't in the greatest shape, but my girlfriend was enamored with the cottage aesthetic, so I was glad she was enjoying her present. We met the host briefly at the front door, then he showed us to our room and basically left us to our own devices. Although, as he was leaving, he mentioned something I didn't quite register in the moment, not until after everything else went down. I'll leave you to be now. You won't even know I'm here. I'm pretty good at going unnoticed. Uh, thank you. Hmm, that was weird, right? Meh, at least we have the whole place to ourselves. Yeah, you're right. Come on, let's check out the house. We spent the next few minutes touring the entire house, which took us a while as it was a fairly big property. Everything was decent enough to my standards, and it seemed like my girlfriend was content with the Airbnb. However, there was one problem that was very unsettling once we noticed it. On all the windows in the house, there were no blinds or curtains of any kind. There were rods above the windows which made it obvious that there had been blinds there, but they had all been taken down. There wasn't even a curtain on the window in the bathroom. Obviously at that point, we were a little freaked out and concerned for our privacy. I texted the host and told him this was a serious problem. A few seconds later, the host responds back, more or less shrugging it off. He said that we were so far out in the woods that there shouldn't be any chance of a person coming by and trying to look through the windows. And also that with all the tree coverage, none of the windows got very much light anyway. Obviously, that wasn't a satisfying response for me or my girlfriend, but we tried our best not to be worried about it so we could be focused on having a good time. We turned in pretty early that night, as we'd had a very long day. Of course, the window in our room didn't have any curtains or blinds either. I remember falling asleep with my eyes half open and looking at the snow coming down outside. For some reason, it was like I was hypnotized by the lack of curtains, and that's when I passed out. Hours later, around 4 in the morning, I woke to the sound of several notifications coming through my phone. I was very groggy and delirious, but I figured it might be important, so I forced myself to roll over and check it. It was Airbnb messaging me, and when I saw what my phone read, I couldn't believe it. Airbnb was telling me to pack all my belongings and leave the property immediately. It felt like my entire world was crashing down before me. It almost seemed like I was dreaming, but what made the situation all the more disturbing was when the Airbnb advised me not to notify the host until we were gone. That's when my heart sank to my stomach. Maybe it was something that Airbnb knew about the host that we didn't. A million thoughts raced across my mind. I assumed the man had to be a serial killer or something. I turned over to my girlfriend and began to wake her up, shrugging at her until she was finally awake. I tried desperately to explain what was going on, but that's when I saw her eyes get super wide. 
And then, she gave the most horrific, blood-curdling shriek I ever heard. There's someone in the window! I turned around in horror, and that's when I saw him. It was the host, peering inside our room with his hands cupped around his face. I screamed and jumped back. That sicko didn't budge. He just stood there watching us while pressed up against the glass. Enraged, I charged at the window and banged my fist against it, nearly shattering it, saying, Leave us alone or go, you cops! My girlfriend pulled me away from the confrontation, and we frantically began packing up all our things and got dressed. All the while, this creepy old man watched us through the window the entire time. Within a couple of minutes, we left the room in a rush. I led my girlfriend through the house, running by the kitchen to grab a blade from the nightstand. As we cautiously made our way outside, I could feel the tension in the air. I didn't know if the creep would pop out of nowhere. Thankfully, we didn't see any sign of him as we headed to the car. Me and my girlfriend quickly threw all our stuff in the back seat, and we got inside and locked the doors. But just as we were about to leave, the man slammed his hand on the side of my window. I frantically drove off and never looked back. On the way home, my girlfriend was already drafting a serious complaint to Airbnb, asking why this guy was allowed to host people in his house in the first place. The only response we got back was that they had received numerous complaints from other guests about how he broke Airbnb rules and regulations on multiple occasions. It just so happened that they revoked his status as a host while we were there. Either way, it's no mystery to me why that place had such bad ratings with that guy around. He strikes me as the kind of guy that probably has his dead wife stashed somewhere in his house. The story was inspired by an incident that happened to a couple sometime last year. The couple claims that Airbnb instructed them to check out immediately and to not alert the host. In one of the messages, Airbnb stated that the host wasn't aware of the situation, making it all the more alarming. The couple then departed the house and that's when the host reached out to them, asking them to ignore any quote-unquote dangerous allegations that Airbnb might have disclosed about him. As soon as I realized I was awake, I knew something was wrong. Everything was all hazy. All I knew was that I was inside of a giant crib in a weird, dark baby bedroom that looked familiar. Like maybe I was at home or sleeping over at someone's house, but even that didn't feel quite right. I really didn't know where I was or how I got there, but I wasn't alone. Inside the crib with me was my friend Chucky, and over in the other crib in the room were the twins, Philip and Lillian. They were all sleeping like logs, which didn't make sense to me. Could I be feeling so paranoid and frightened while they were literally drooling? By the looks of it, we lost our minds on a milk drinking binge that just went way too far, until we passed out for God knows how long. I shook it off and started trying to wake up Chucky, shaking and shoving him, but he refused to open his eyes. Chucky, wake up! Come on, you gotta get up! Uh, what do you mean? I I'm just sleeping. Guys, get up! Something's wrong! Can any of you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Tommy. You're really, really loud. Could you keep it down a bit? I want to go back to sleep. No, you can't! You gotta stay up and help me figure out what's going on! What do you mean? I mean, like, where are we? How did we get here? And how are we gonna get out of here? Uh, I don't know where we are. What are you two blabbering about? Can you keep it down? Everybody listen to me! I don't know what's going on, but something is really wrong! Can any of you remember what happened? No? Exactly! We shouldn't be here! We have to get out! Uh, okay, but how do we do that? Well, it's obvious! We have to climb out of these cribs! No way, Tommy! You can't! Look how tall it is! If you fall, you'll die! We don't have any other choice, Chucky! Uh, I I'll, I'll go first! I was scared, but I knew I had to climb if I wanted any chance of escape. By the time I got to the top of the ledge, I was so dizzy from the height that I had to take a moment to steady myself. I took a deep breath in before committing to the jump. That's when the door flew open, and Angelica stormed in holding two baby bottles full of milk, screaming. What the hell are you doing? Get back in the crib where you belong, you idiot. Yes, Angelica. I I'm sorry. You better be. Now everybody get ready for your milk. Can I get breastfed instead? Shut up! 
You first, twinsies. No, don't do it, you guys. Don't drink the milk. I tried to stop them, but it was too late. As soon as the bottles were in their hands, the bottles were in their mouths, and they were drinking the milk. And just like that, Philip and Lillian rolled over onto their sides and suckled brainlessly. I couldn't believe what kind of grip this formula had on them. It was like they were hooked on it and couldn't escape their need for it. There had to be some kind of special secret ingredient hiding in whatever was in those bottles. Angelica laughed at them. Then she turned and looked at me and Chucky with the smile of an evil witch, saying, You're next. For a moment, she stepped outside of the room to grab two more bottles. And while she was away, I tried to warn Chucky, who was just starting to look as frightened as I felt. Listen, Chucky, whatever you do, don't drink that milk. It's bad for you. I don't know how I know, but I know, okay? Promise me you won't drink it, no matter what she says. Yeah, Tommy, I promise. You won't either, right? Of course not. We got this, Chucky. We're in this together. What do you two think you're doing? Less talking, more sucking. Angelica approached our crib and shoved the bottle in Chucky's face, but he turned and tried to push it away. This made her even madder, so she grabbed him by the collar and lifted him up into the air. Come, Chucky. All you have to do is... Drink it! With tears streaming down his face, Chucky folded and opened his mouth. Angelica then shoved the bottle in and dropped him. In an instant, he was in the same state as Philip and Lillian. Now it's your turn, little Tommy. Open wide. Screw you! Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! Open up, open up! Open up! No! I slipped up. I should have just kept my mouth shut, but Angelica got her way. As soon as that bottle popped into my mouth, it was all over for me. <sighs> when will you idiots ever learn? Damn it. I hate this stupid job. How do I even get stuck doing this anyway? I don't care about any of this. I should just start putting cyanide in those stupid bottles. Then there won't be a business and I won't have to be here. Wouldn't that be nice? We've been waiting on you, Angelica. What took you so long? I had some trouble with the rats in 104, but it's all taken care of. Are you ready to take care of room 105? Yeah, whatever. Give me the bottles. There you go, Angelica. <laughs> Desperation around Valentine's Day can get a girl into trouble. Hopefully it's just an embarrassing date that you have to live down over time. But for me, it was much worse. I was in college, and the dreaded date of February 14th was getting dangerously close while I still had no one to call my own. My friends were all over Tinder and kept telling me to get on it too. But after trying it a few times, I knew I wasn't going to find what I was looking for. Most of the men on Tinder, local to me, were just thirsty cutthroats that want to use you once or twice and then never see you again. I was a bit of a hopeless romantic, and I was starting to believe I was becoming more naive and gullible by holding out for the perfect man. That is until one night, when I got a random DM on Instagram from a super hot guy that was just my type. I didn't think it was too good to be true. I was just surprised that he would pursue me over everyone else. His name on Instagram was Anthony something, and his message read, Hey there, beautiful. It took me a while to work up the courage to reply, but when I eventually did, I texted, Hi there, handsome. We hit it off fairly quickly and DM'd each other every now and then. On the third day, he asked me out on a date. I was a little anxious and wasn't exactly ready to see him yet, so I replied with no. Regardless, I found it a little strange that he would pitch to meet at a local hilltop for our first meeting. I always said I couldn't do it for one reason or another, but it became even more uncomfortable when he persisted with it. He would always send messages saying, How about that local hilltop today? It's beautiful weather right now. How about we go on a bike ride to the hilltop? I can't believe how many passes I gave him just because I thought he was hot. He asked me to go to the same hilltop every day for four days, and he would always shoot down any other date ideas. It was apparent that he was adamant about this hilltop. Eventually, it was the night before Valentine's Day, and I finally had some real time on my hands, but we still hadn't agreed on a date. 
That's when he asked me a different question, saying, I got us a present for Valentine's Day. Want to know what it is? I was curious, so I replied back with, Yes, I do. A few seconds later, he replies back with, I got us a nice hotel, and then a wink sign at the end. The way he brought it up made it seem like he booked an expensive room in the nicest hotel in town. But when he sent me the address, my heart sank. It wasn't nice at all. It was this dingy motel on the sketchy side of town. Suddenly, the proposition felt a lot scummier. But I gave him the benefit of the doubt, assuming he was tight on money. I was so excited to finally see him in person that I didn't care where it was, as long as it wasn't that stupid hilltop. After I showered, got dressed, and filled up on gas, I started driving across town to the motel. By then, it was after dark. The parking lot was almost full, so I parked near the lobby. I remember waving through the glass at the clerk behind the desk as I walked past the front building to the room number I was told to go to. I also remember him giving me a strange look that I couldn't understand, but I brushed it off and continued walking. When I got up to the right door, I knocked quietly so I wouldn't draw attention. Nobody answered after a minute, so I knocked again, louder this time. Still no answer. I pounded on the door several more times until it finally opened, <gasps> revealing my most haunting, worst possible nightmare I could ever imagine. The man who opened the door was this gigantic slob that looked nothing like the Anthony I saw on Instagram. Um, I don't know if I have the right room. Is Anthony here? Yes, sweetheart. I'm Anthony. <gasps> I felt like I was going to throw up. Everything hit me all at once as I realized I'd been such an idiot to let myself get catfished this bad on Valentine's Day. But as soon as I started to walk away, the sicko reached out and grabbed me by the waist and yanked me into the room like a rag doll. Everything crashed and burned in a matter of seconds. I started screaming for help as he slammed the door and threw me across the room onto the bed. Then, he started to undress as he blocked me in by standing in front of the only exit. He then started stripping down to his underwear as I frantically went to grab the lamp on the nightstand. But it was useless. The creep stomped toward me and smacked the lamp out of my hand. It pushed me over again, this time immediately oh. getting on top of me. Get off of me! Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! His sheer size and weight were enough to pin me down by the arms and legs and crush my chest so much I could barely breathe. I wailed one last time before he started to smother me. I thought I was about to die in my hotel room, but right as he crouched his face towards me, I heard the door open. Hey! The creep turned his head to the side just in time to get bashed in the face by a baseball bat. He lost his balance and was pushed over off of me onto the floor. That's when I finally saw who came in the room. It was the clerk from the front desk that I waved at a minute ago. Stand on the floor! You move and I bash your head in! I was too stunned to speak. I guess that motel clerk was used to seeing sketchy stuff at that motel and could tell when he needed to intervene. Thanks to his intuition, I'm alive. A few minutes later, the cops arrived and arrested Anthony. I gave my statement to the police and got an escort back home. I didn't sleep for weeks, and it only got worse when the story hit the news. It turns out that he was linked to the victims of several fatalities that were found at a local hilltop. The same thing he tried to get me to go to. It's no wonder why he was so persistent about it. It terrifies me knowing that could have easily been me. This story was inspired by a story of a psychotic man that used social media platforms like Instagram and Snapchat to lure his victims to a hilltop on Valentine's Day. As stated in the story, he has been linked to several cases. The username Anthony was of course just an alias. His real name is Keegan, and he has since been sentenced for his heinous crimes. Um, I don't know if I have the right thing to do with this. It all happened without warning. One moment, I was comfy, dozing off in my room. Then when I opened my eyes, everything familiar to me had vanished without a trace, only to be replaced by a capacious pink room where I sat next to a creepy doll on a giant couch. Where the hell am I? Is this some sort of nightmare? I asked myself frantically. I ran my fingers across my face, immediately noticing something different. I became aware of my odd hairstyle, including my large red nose. I knew I had become a clown, bewildered. I just wanted to scream. I didn't know if this was some sick nightmare or if I was being held captive. And so, I trusted my instincts, aiming to get the hell out of here. When I got up, I glanced at the creepy doll next to me. It looked like a clown as well. I couldn't help but freak out as I scanned around the room, eventually spotting a window. I got up from the giant couch and made my way to the window where I peeped through the curtains. 
I remember seeing more of that weird empty cartoonish looking world that didn't make any sense at all. Then, casually walking along the sidewalk were two people who looked exactly like me. Clowns. One had orange hair, purple shorts, and yellow shoes, while the other was an old lady wearing a green sweater and a purple skirt. They waved at me like they had known me for a long time. But that was impossible. I had never seen them before, so out of fear, I shut the curtains and ran back to the giant couch, rummaging through the pillows as I freaked out. Moments later, I felt something sharp and was initially frightened. Then, when I looked closer, I saw a seashell and picked it up. I put it next to my ear and could hear ocean sounds. However, I then heard a voice, low and sinister apart from the sound of the waves, telling me to obey the doll's commands. Freaking out once more, I tossed the seashell across the room. I situated myself on the far end of the couch, away from the creepy doll as I had my eyes fixated on it. I just want to go home. Then suddenly, the doll began to speak, its voice docile, tiny, and malicious. But you are home. <gasps> Convinced my life was in danger, all I could think of was how to escape, but unaware of where I was, I didn't know where else to go, nor how to avoid getting caught by those who seemed to have recognized me from outside. I was sweating like crazy as my entire body trembled in fear. A part of me was convinced that I was going nuts. Then, while the doll's body remained stationary on the couch, its head moved to face me. Seconds later, it grinned and said, There's nowhere else to go, my dear, unless... Unless what? I asked, my body still quivering. Unless you play the clock game. I had no idea what this entity had in mind, but I didn't have a choice either. So, I took the only chance I had and played that silly game. No matter what, I had to win. I had to be free. Having found my courage and resolve, I stood up and said, Okay, fine, have it your way. So how do I play this game? The little creep clapped her hands in delight and laid out the mechanics. It's pretty simple. First, you must lay on the clock rug over there. Then, touch six numbers of my choosing without moving your other ligaments. It seemed simple enough to understand until the doll added. But remember, you must keep smiling the entire time. If you don't, you lose and you're mine forever. Do you understand? I gulped, knowing what a huge risk it would be. But eventually, I nodded, agreeing to the terms of the cursed doll. Excellent! Now first, reach out to number 12 with your right hand. I quickly positioned my arm to touch the designated number. Good! Now, put your left arm to number 1. I stretched my arm with a bit of tension, but gladly, it was still doable. Okay, not bad. Now this time, give me five more minutes with your left arm without moving your shoulder. <gasps> Unless I was double-jointed or some kind of freak working for the circus, I knew I wouldn't be able to do it without breaking my bones. But as I glanced at the crazed doll, its words burrowed deep inside my head, and I remembered that if I lost, I'd have to stay here forever. One way or another, it had to be done. And so, with all the desperation within me burning, my only goal was to escape. I forced my arm to reach for number two, and then my arm cracked with tremendous pain. Perfect! Now, put your left leg at number three. The doll sounded more aggressive, but knowing I could still endure the pain, I broke my left leg to reach number three. Ah! Here's another one! Place your right leg to number eleven. With the adrenaline pumping through my veins, I didn't mind cracking another bone as I reached for it, tears running down my face while I continued to smile. You're amazing, Lunette. I like you. Now, let's take things up a notch. She pointed at my head, and with a sinister grin, she said, Now, place your head at number six. Do this successfully, and you're free to go. I panicked, knowing it would be impossible to achieve. My entire body was distorted, ruined, but I was still determined to get out of here. And so, I laughed like a lunatic as I awkwardly twisted my head, almost reaching 180 degrees. I kept turning as much as I could while I stared into the eyes of my demise. I didn't care anymore. I just did what I could, but obviously was unable to complete my objective. And that's when I saw the doll pull out a knife from under the pillow saying, That was very exciting, Lunette, but I'm afraid it's game over.
Hey Molly, look who we have here. Another candidate ready to play Lynette the Clown. Why don't you have a seat on the big comfy couch, darling? So, are you ready to play Lynette the Clown? I used to go to Burger King all the time. I'm a big guy and I like to eat, but I never learned to cook for myself. So I go through a lot of fast food drive throughs especially Burger King since it used to be the only place on my way home from work that was open 24-7. But the last time I went to Burger King, I had a very disturbing experience. I pulled my truck up to the intercom at a little past two in the morning as per usual. But strangely, even after a few minutes, nobody had asked me for my order. Uh, hello? Anybody there? Sometimes they don't realize somebody's waiting in line until I say something. But even after I hollered at them, they still weren't saying anything. Hey, you in there? I'm trying to place an order! I usually wouldn't use that type of tone with employees, but I was very hungry and cranky. And I didn't want to have to go across town to McDonald's just to get something to eat. <sighs> Come on, guys. Your lights are still on. The sign says 24-7. I know you're in there. Don't make me pull up around the corner. And there I was. Still left hanging with no response. Alright, fine. I'm coming up to the window. After I couldn't reach through the intercom, I pulled up to the window, hoping to give them a piece of my mind. I was thinking they were either sleeping on the job or ignoring me, and I took offense to either one. But when I pulled up to the window, I didn't see anybody inside. All the lights were still on though, so I knew they were open. I sat there and stared through the window for several minutes, trying to catch a glimpse of someone. However, as it started to get closer to 2.30 in the morning, I realized I could have gone to McDonald's and eaten already, and I was just about to give up. But at the last second, I heard people talking from inside. Suddenly, I was pissed off all over again. Hey, bozo! Get off your lazy butts and take my order! And clean the wax out of your ears while you're at it! I even knocked on the window, too. But it looked like the only thing that I'd accomplished was making the people inside go quiet. It was starting to look like a lost cause I should just drive away from. <laughs> then, out of nowhere, the cashier's face slams into the window. He was drenched in sweat with bloodshot eyes and his hands pressed against the glass. He startled me so bad that I was at a loss for words. The poor guy slowly opened the window, and I could see how much his hands were shaking. Good evening, sir. How may I take your order? I'll, um, I'll just have a Whopper. Thank you. W will that be all today, sir? Yes, please. Just the Whopper and I'll be on my way. The cashier paused for a moment, and I saw him clench his jaw like he was holding back something he wanted to say. I stared him down and waited for him to spit it out. Are you sure you wouldn't like anything else? We have lots of other food items on the menu. Sides, sauces, desserts, breakfast biscuits, and- no, Thank you, man. I said I just wanted a Whopper and that's it. <laughs> but sir, I, I insist. And I insist that you shut up and listen to me. Just place my order, take my money, and give me my food! I felt bad for yelling at him again, but I was done with playing whatever his game was. His whole body was trembling by then, and he was sweating like a pig. But finally, he nodded and punched it in. No problem, sir. Just the Whopper sandwich, and that'll be one thousand dollars. What? Do you think I'm an idiot? I know how much a Whopper costs, and it ain't a thousand dollars. Matter of fact, you ought to be paying me for wasting my time. Do you even know how long I've been out here waiting for you? Thirty minutes, and all I want is one Whopper. So stop playing games and do your job. My apologies, sir. It must be the machine. It's very old. It must be broken. I'm working the whole restaurant by myself tonight, so I haven't had time to fix it. Blah, blah, blah. Quit whining. Your job isn't that hard. Oh, uh, but it is. Um, you see, I was thinking, um, if you could just give me a tip in cash. What? A tip? You know, just a thousand dollars cash for holding down the business. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was so pissed off again that I'd gone far past the point of yelling and screaming and reached a boiling point where I was tempted to just punch the scheming dirtbag's lights out. Listen here, buddy. I'm this close to just leaving. But honestly, I'm closer to giving you a knuckle sandwich. Ever heard of a sandwich before? It's what I've been trying to get from you this whole time. I know your machine is working just fine. You're the problem. You, 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 you lazy, entitled, slimy little snot-nosed brat! Suddenly. The cashier did something bizarre. He now had his hands clasped together and was hanging out the window and pleading with me. 
Please, please, sir, just give me the money. I need it. You don't understand. Please, you have to give it to me. You have to. Screw off. I pushed him back and started to drive off. But then to my surprise, the scrawny little twerp lunged forward and grabbed me by the collar. I stopped so I wouldn't accidentally kill him with my truck. And that's when he got even more desperate. Please, you don't understand. Just give me the money, please. There was sadness and fear in his eyes, which made me hold back from hitting him. He was crying as he screamed at me. He froze after a few seconds, so I grabbed him by the collar and set him back a few inches. Get off of me! You're barking up the wrong tree! But then, I was completely taken aback when he whispered, Please call the cops! What? Unfortunately, he didn't have time to explain. <gasps> Somebody appeared behind him and yanked him back through the window. Then, some deranged creep was staring me down, and it was obvious they were not an employee of Burger King. In a second, he charged forward and tried to grab me, but I sped off just in time and raced home. I was so confused and disturbed that I had lost all my appetite, and I called it a night and went straight to bed. The next morning, I flipped the TV onto the local news, and what I saw made my heart sink. The same Burger King I was at was reportedly robbed, and that poor worker's face was plastered on the broadcast as the face of the victim. He was allegedly held at gunpoint and didn't end up surviving the ordeal. To this day, I still beat myself up about it. Maybe I could have saved him. If I had known there was a human life on the line, <gasps> things would have been different. I can't even think about eating at Burger King ever again. On November 18th, a man entered a Burger King demanding free food. The employees reportedly refused his demand. Things only escalated from there, which prompted an employee to think quickly on their feet. They alerted a customer in the drive-thru to call 911 during the robbery. My name is Wednesday, and I live with the most detestable family in existence. I spend every waking moment of my life trapped with them inside this condemnable ruin of what might have once been a noteworthy estate, and even though it's big enough to be called a mansion, there are too many of these deranged freaks I'm somehow related to lurking around. There's father, who they call Gomez, but everyone knows that the one who's really in charge is my mother, Morticia. Then, there was my barbaric little brother, Pugsley, who probably annoys me more than anyone or anything else in this world. But aside from him, there are two of the dumbest creatures to ever walk the face of the earth. One was the utterly soulless Lurch, and the repulsively maladjusted Uncle Fester, who I hope would perish in the most sadistic way possible. And of course, there's also The Thing, a disgusting disgusting little abomination, worse than rats, and we've got plenty of rats. It's not like I had anywhere else to go, either. Out here in the barren emptiness of the countryside, there isn't much to do, and not a lot of potential suffering to cause, except for the cold political brutality of the dinner table, a nightly practice that father seems strangely infatuated with. Last Wednesday was probably the worst family dinner of all, so far. Wednesday. How come I never see you smile? Whatever could be wrong with you? Because I hate everyone and everything. Everyone and everything? Yes, including all of you. Impossible! How could you hate your dear old Uncle Fester? Just look at that face! Doesn't that make you want to smile? Vile. And what about your freakishly adorable little brother? Doesn't his talent for mischief fill your heart with an appetite for destruction? Hey, Wednesday, watch this! <laughs> I was much the same way when I was her age. I think I once went an entire year without a smile. But I could swear I saw you grinning last Wednesday, Wednesday. That's a lie. Calm down, everyone. I know just what'll make her crack. This used to work on you all the time when you were just a little helpless, defenseless infant. That's when father took the cursed serving spoon and scooped out a wretched hunk of putrid, unidentifiable meat at the center of the table and started to wave it around in the air, circling my face and cooing like a moron. Here, here comes the plane, about to crash unexpectedly into the mountainside. Here, here it comes. There will be no survivors. Ah! I saw the spoon approaching me, and that's when my instincts kicked in. I knocked it out of his hand and abruptly stood up from my seat. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops. Wednesday, Friday, Adams. If you are part of this family, you will eat with the family. Now pick up that spoon and serve yourself a plate. I'd rather be six feet in the ground than spend another minute with any of you. You. That can be arranged. I was at my limit. I turned around and started to storm off from the table, 
only for that malformed guard dog, Lurch, to be standing right in front of me. Reluctantly, I took my seat again. Father snapped his fingers at Lurch, commanding him to keep me there. The decomposing corpse put his cold, dead hands firmly on my shoulders and pressed down, making sure I wouldn't be able to go anywhere until the family was done with me. I'd never felt such unbridled hatred and rage in my life. I tried to maintain my composure, but I couldn't keep myself from turning the slightest bit red and breathing heavier than normal. All of my supposedly loving family pointed and laughed at me in my defeated state. Look at her! She's like a rotting tomato! Can we grind her up into a paste and serve her on spaghetti? That's not a bad idea now, my little Pugsley. But do contain yourself. Your father is not done teaching your sister a valuable lesson about what it means to be part of this family. That's exactly right. Now, little Miss Wednesday, you know we like to eat especially on Wednesdays. Why do you think we named you Wednesday? We prepared this entire dinner just to appease your standards, and now you say that it's not good enough? I won't tolerate such insolence in this household. So you had better pick something off this table and eat it, because if you don't, we'll all be sitting here forever, waiting together for all eternity. And all you have to do to get out is take a single bite. Go on, Wednesday. There's no other way. All their eyes turned to me as they began banging their forks and knives upon the table, chanting my cavemen. Eat it! Eat it! Eat it! Eat it! I accepted that I had no other choice choice. So I scanned the table for the least disgusting thing I could eat. The trouble was it all looked absolutely repulsive. Uncle Fester must have cooked it all himself using his own regrown body parts. But the longer I looked, the tighter that Lurch's grip became. I knew I had to pick something soon. So at last I pointed to something that wasn't even on the table. The look of confused surprise on all their faces was priceless. Even the Lurch became so distracted that his grip loosened just long enough for me to stand once again, fork and knife in hand. Now that I've come to think about it, there has been this one thing that I've always wanted to eat. It's been weighing heavily on my mind for many moons now. I want to eat thing. <laughs> I broke out into the pursuit of my prey. I wanted to devour it, destroy it, annihilate every last trace of its existence, and extract every ounce of pleasure possible from the act of doing so. Finally, I returned to the dinner table with my prey and threw it down before them. Then, as it finally came time to eat, I realized just how hungry I'd made myself. I've never felt more like a wild animal in my life. It was invigorating. <laughs> That's my daughter Wednesday. Welcome to the Adams Family, baby. This story happened a few years ago when I worked at Burger King. I swear it's all true. And in any case, it's a vivid and traumatic memory that I must live with. But despite this, nobody ever seems to believe me. Of course, that won't stop me from sharing my experience. I was a college dropout, so I had to get the job at the dirty Burger King in town so I could make enough money to move out of my parents' house. I was full-time and usually got stuck with the short end of the stick. My boss made me work the graveyard shifts, since the particular franchise I worked at was a 24-hour location. I didn't mind, though. The night was very relaxed compared to the day. The longer I worked there, the more I got used to seeing the same sparse crowd of regulars. It wasn't just the drive through that was always open, but the dining area, too. There were usually a handful of students on their laptops hopped up on the crappy coffee and studying feverishly throughout the night. Aside from them, there were three or four homeless guys that would pitch in their quarters on a cup of coffee just so they could all have an excuse to chill inside. And towards the end of my shift, I'd always see the same set of corporate businessmen stopping in for a bite to eat before going to work. Honestly, it was a decent job. However, that was only the case until one very different night, after which my life has never been the same. It started off deader than usual. None of the regulars were showing face and barely anybody had come through the drive through either. I was the only person working that night so this was all fine with me. My boss had intentionally put me on the schedule by myself, expecting correctly that there would be very little business to do. At around the midpoint of my shift, the whole place was empty, and I assumed I wouldn't get any customers for a couple hours, so I started to make myself busy by mopping the floor. I went into the kitchen to fill up the bucket, but when I came back out front, 
somebody was sitting in a window booth on the far side of the restaurant. They were dressed rather convincingly like the Burger King mascot, and had the same crown and cloak and facial hair and everything. The only problem with his costume was just how deranged and weathered he looked. I casually rolled the bucket over near where he was sitting and started to mop in that area to get a closer look at him. I certainly didn't recognize him from anywhere but the Burger King commercials. But since he didn't have any food on his table yet, I was contractually obligated to talk to him. Uh, g good evening, sir. C could I help you with anything? I demand to be served. A Whopper! Well, sure, I can make you a Whopper, but you'll have to come up front and pay for it. The man then gave me a death glare. Fine! Have it your way. He barked at me as I walked back to the counter. Where do you <gasps> think you're going? You're supposed to let the king walk ahead of you, peasant! Um, sure, go ahead. He then cut me off and walked up to the counter, waiting impatiently for the three seconds it took me to catch up. I punched in his order and told him the price. That'll be $6.49, sir. All I got for another tense moment was the same hateful look in his eyes, until he reached into the donation jar on the counter and pulled out a random fistful of change and threw it at me. Keep the change and never ask me to pay for anything in my own establishment ever again. Finally, he turned around and went back to his seat. I contemplated calling the cops on him for essentially stealing money from needy children, but then I thought I could take matters into my own hands and get back at him for emasculating me over a couple of dollars. I retreated into the kitchen to make his Whopper, and I made it with a special ingredient. I got out the lettuce and set it on the floor, then stepped on it, jumping up and down a few times while cracking myself up by saying the old line, Number 15. Burger King foot lettuce! <laughs> Once I was done entertaining myself, I constructed the sandwich and brought it out to the needy Burger King. Here's your Whopper, sir. Have a good night. I started to walk away, only for him to snap his fingers at me. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Do you really expect me to eat this by myself? A king must never eat his food with his own hands. You must feed it to me, you idiot! I'm sorry, sir, but that's against our store policies. At least I think it is. I am the king of this joint! I make the rules! So get over here and fulfill your duty before I shove this whopper up your mom's wop! <gasps> Suddenly, I was a little scared. I wanted to avoid escalating the conflict with this Burger King guy, so I gave in and decided to feed him like he wanted, hoping he would go away if I did what he wanted. On the positive side, it had the added bonus of ensuring he ate the special recipe I made for him. I was nervous though. My hands were shaking as I reached down and picked up the Whopper, then gradually brought it up to his mouth. Um, open wide? I guess. And that's when one of the most horrific memory haunting things I've ever seen happened. The Burger King's mouth jerked open and stretched inhumanely. And that's when it happened. <laughs> he lunged at me clamping his teeth down on my wrist and devouring the sandwich in my entire hand in a single bite. I screamed in pain and tried to break free, but his jaw's grip was on me like an alligator's. As he started thrashing around, he pulled on my arm and flailed me back and forth, repeatedly slamming me down on the table. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! Somebody get this guy off of me! Somebody help! I woke up from a coma in a hospital. <gasps> the first thing I did when I came to was look down to my right hand, only to see a wad of bandages, but no right hand. As soon as I could speak, I tried to tell my parents what happened to me, but when I did, they just looked at me like I was crazy. They tried to tell me some BS story about an alligator that snuck out of the lake behind the restaurant and ambushed me when I took out the trash, but I knew that couldn't be true. The funny thing is, I was fired from Burger King and barred from ever entering it again, as though it were all my fault. I'm not even allowed to see the security footage of what happened. I think the BK Corporation put a gag order on my parents and told them to lie to me. The only reason I can think that they would do such a thing as if the Burger King himself was more than an urban legend, but an actual real person, if you can call him a person. Number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. <laughs> For the last six years, I've been living in fear as a single woman all the way through my 30s and into my 40s. 
I am forced to fear for my safety, and here's why. It started on a Valentine's Day. I was doing my typical morning routine of watering the plants that grow around my small bungalow home. When I got to the front of the house, I noticed an unusual letter sitting on my porch. It was in a brownish envelope, and on one side had five crudely drawn X's, one big one and four smaller ones circling it. I opened it on my doorstep, and inside was a Valentine's Day card with the cat picture on it. I then opened the card and began reading it. And that's when this growing sensation of nausea and vertigo started to tell me something was very, very wrong. It was a handwritten note full of disturbing things. There were references to my daily activities, revealing that I was being watched, and other sickening comments about me and how I looked and whatnot. But even with all of that, they still had the nerve to sign off on the letter saying, Lots of loving kisses on Valentine's Day to my sweet little oblivious victim. From your longtime secret admirer who has now become your stalker, Gordon. And at the bottom of the letter, the same symbol of the five X's. By the time I finished reading it, my hands were shaking. I didn't know of any Gordon. Freaked out. I phoned the police right away, but I was rather disappointed with the response I got. They said all they could do was file a report and take the letter as evidence. Other than that, they didn't have enough to go off of to look for him. In any case, I didn't get much shut-eye on that first night. When morning finally came, I cowered until I heard the postman come and go, and then I peeked through the blinds to see if there was another brownish envelope with X's on it. Thankfully, there wasn't. A few more days passed and no more letters from Gordon came in, and slowly I was able to feel less paranoid. I started to rationalize the event as perhaps a prank pulled by some neighborhood kids. But unfortunately, that was all out the table on the day when I walked out the door to go to work, and I saw another letter on my porch. I knew it had to be from Gordon, due to the five X's on it. I didn't want to touch it, but part of me felt like I had to read it. I picked it up and started to unravel the contents, and again, on the front of the card was an odd looking cat image. On the inside was the handwriting of an insane person confessing their love and admiration for me. He wrote much more in this letter, talking about the things he wanted to do to me, things that gave him pleasure to think about doing, dreams about kidnapping and imprisoning me, all expressed in painstaking and vulgar detail, and again. He signed off with a chummy tone while remembering to remind me that I was in danger, saying, I hope you know that I think of you all the time, and I wish that we will be together very soon. Endless, messy love and kisses from your stalker and soon-to-be killer, Gordon. And then capping off with his signature X, I stood there for a brief moment as the adrenaline built up and then boiled over, sending me into a deep panic. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! I went inside and immediately locked all the windows and doors before I got my phone to alert the authorities again. However, the response was the same. They took the letter as evidence and added it to the pre-existing case file, then basically told me to stop overreacting. I tried to reason with them saying I felt I was in danger, but they brushed me off like they had bigger things to worry about. And to nobody's surprise, about a week later, my worst fears were realized. It was in the middle of the night, and I was still unable to settle down from receiving Gordon's last threatening letter. I had been tossing and turning in bed for hours when I first heard noises coming from outside my bedroom window. I shot up out of bed to quickly hide underneath it. When I stopped moving, I could hear the sound again, and it was clearly footsteps, like someone was walking around my house, just outside my bedroom, getting closer and closer, until it finally stopped. I had to cover my mouth to keep from screaming when I saw the silhouette of a man looking through my window. I knew it had to be that Gordon freak. I went frozen stiff, hoping he would just go away, but then he tapped on the glass and started talking like he knew I was in there. Hey beautiful, are you sleeping? I forgot to give you something from last Valentine's Day. I wanted to vomit, but I was forced not to move a muscle. I just waited in agonizing silence, praying he would just go away. After several excruciating minutes passed, I never heard him walk away. His silhouette was gone, but I felt he was still outside my house. I could feel the fear inside me growing, convincing myself that if I continued to let him stand out there, it was only a matter of time before he couldn't resist the temptation to break in. 
At last, I made a break for it, climbing out from under the bed, grabbing my phone from the nightstand, and running to the other side of the house as I called the police yet again. I stayed on the phone with the operators as I cowered in my linen closet, waiting for help to arrive. I was quite disappointed when the cops came and Gordon had already left the scene. All they found was another letter on my doorstep, but I didn't bother picking it up. I just let the cops take it, and that's all they ended up doing. They literally made no effort to find the man who continues to torment me to this day. Since then, I have shared my story with the internet, urging anyone who sells letters, works at the post office, or thinks they recognize the handwriting to contact me. Over the years, my paranoia has grown worse and worse, but I don't want to move away from my home. I refuse to admit defeat to this scumbag. Still, it strikes fear in me to know that Gordon is still out there and still knows where I live. This story was inspired by a real life case regarding an alleged stalker quote unquote named Gordon. The images below are photographs of the Valentine's Day cards with the distinguishable cat image and disturbing messages with the signature five X's. Since then, the culprit has been caught. Here is the image of him, revealing Gordon to be a 68-year-old man who had been obsessed with the victim for years. He has since pled guilty to one charge of stalking. I woke up in a complete daze with no clue where I was. I don't know how long I'd been lying on the ground for, nor did I know how I got there. Everything was dark and dusty. I sat up and looked around, noticing that I was underneath what had to be a bed, except it was gigantic, larger than any bed known to man. To get a bearing on my surroundings, I walked to the edge of the bed and peered out to what was beyond it. None of it made any sense. There was a seemingly endless expanse of wooden flooring ahead of me. And all over the floor was a cluttered mess of children's toys. Like the living toys from Toy Story. Except none of them were moving. When I looked closer, I could see every toy had been slash gutted and skewered across the room. It appeared to be a giant kid's bedroom to fit the giant bed I was under. I didn't understand why someone would build such an enormous room. Who would have use for that? However, as I thought to lay <gasps> down in my own hands for the first time, a disturbing realization dawned on me. I too was a toy. <laughs> I then realized this room wasn't oversized at all. It was me who was small, toy-sized, and not the human I thought I was. Suddenly, a sense of panic and confusion took hold of me, and I marched out from under the bed to try and find some place that made sense. This bedroom looked familiar, like I had been in it before. Maybe like I grew up in it, but none of this seemed possible. I kept walking until I made it all the way out to the center of the room, saying, Uh, hello, is anybody here? Hello? Then, out of nowhere, I could see Toy Story Woody colliding with me, picking me up and carrying me across the room at full speed. Before I knew it, he ran behind the looming tower of a laundry basket and threw me down in the center of a circle of several other toys. Hey, what's going- Shh. Quiet down, partner. We don't want it to find us. Don't want what to find us? Don't play Space Cadet with us. We know you saw it. No, no, I swear, I don't know what you're talking Shh. about. I bit my tongue and looked around at the toys that were staring down at me. I recognized each and every one of them from my childhood, but I'd never seen them like this. Woody and Buzz were agitated while the rest of the pack were trembling. Look, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. I haven't seen anybody but you guys. That's impossible! We know you saw him, you piece of shit! I don't know what you're talking about. I just woke up out of the bed! It must have been there. Do you take us for a bunch of dummies?! Hold on, Buzz. Ease up on him. He's probably just been through a lot. <sighs> We've all been through a lot. But there's no use being paranoid. We're all in this together. Right, but what are our options, Woody? We can't just sit here, we have to- Excuse me, I'm sorry, but could you tell me what you guys are talking about? What's this it? You sad, strange little man. Your mind is completely fried, isn't it? Don't worry about his mind, Buzz. Use that big space brain of yours and figure us a way out of this mess. Alright, partner, listen. Don't let your amnesia slow you down when the time comes to run. You'll know it when you see it. It's an abomination, made by some lost cause ne'er do well who thought it'd be a good idea to surgically combine a robot spider with the head of a baby doll. It's got eight ghastly legs of steel, claws for snatching lost little toys like yourself, a head full of razor sharp spikes, and one all seeing eye. What's its name? Those who see it and manage to survive long enough to tell the tale call it 
baby face. <gasps> all of a sudden, a wretched scream rang out. We all looked to see where it came from, just as the body of the boy was thrown into the wall next to us. Then, Babyface came around the corner of our hiding spot and attacked. We all scattered and ran screaming, but that thing already grabbed two of us by the time they could turn around. I lost track of the group immediately and retreated back to the shelter of the bed as fast as I could. I hid under there and went completely still. I then was forced to listen to the pandemonium of all my favorite toys being massacred into oblivion, one by one. Woody was the last to fall. He tried to confront that monster in an old-fashioned duel, but his last stand was doomed from the start. After that, it got quiet. Too quiet. I tried to listen for the mechanical skittering of its legs, but there was just silence. Out of nowhere, the claw grabbed me by the leg and ripped me out from under the bed. Now I was dangling in front of that thing's awful face. I knew there was one more little plaything around here. Let me go! Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! It started playing with me, tossing me up into the air with one arm and catching me with another, flinging me all around like I was a rag doll. After getting <clears> thrown <throat> to the floor, I tried getting up and running away, but I was two dazed by the impact. That's when the thing <gasps> jumped on top of me, saying, Big time's over. The last thing I saw before closing my eyes were the pincers about to tear me apart. But then I woke up. <gasps> my heart was racing and I was drenched in a cold sweat. But other than that, everything was normal. I wasn't a toy anymore. I was a normal kid again. Back in my normal bedroom, my collection of toys were scattered across the room. But that was always how I left them when I was done playing with them. That's when I realized I was out of the horrible nightmare. But then I felt something crawling on top of my head. A chill ran down my spine. Right as a gigantic spider crawled down my face. I'm a daughter living in a house full of wenches. For the past several days, my pathetic family kept urging me to go on some lame family vacation. I whispered to my father, making it evident that I would rather tarnish than go on any outing of their likeness. His sunken, beady eyes reciprocated mother's affectionate gaze, displaying their adoration toward each other while Pugsley and I sat across from them in the dining room. Then, when my mother couldn't help but notice, she asked, What's wrong, Wednesday? Don't tell me you still despise your father and I. You already know the answer to your own questions, mother. I did everything I could to make her realize that forcing me to take a vacation was a big mistake, but as usual, she only listened to my father and herself, vividly displaying similar dispositions. They knew I dreaded going on a family trip, something so ill-advised and pretentious that my parents' desperation to bridge the gap between us made me nauseous. They prodded me relentlessly, begging me to reconsider, but I wasn't the type to cave in, so I told them from the darkest part of my soul. I hope you get into a car crash. The vehicle is on its last legs, so your chances are about 90%. Then, moments later, my father approached me and said, We are going to miss you, my little Rose Spike. Don't feel too lonely while we're away. While attempting to wrap his arms around me, I didn't like being hugged. They all knew that, and yet, my parents constantly insisted. So, to cut a long story short, eventually, they left without me, allowing me to do anything I desired without unnecessary interference. Later that night, I killed time playing with spiders, and as I fondled the webs, I heard a loud knock on the door. Assuming it was merely the wind and nothing more, I simply carried on doing what I was doing until it happened again. What frightened me most was uneventful to me, so it was relatively easy for me to ignore it. But hearing it for a second time, that's when I confirmed that there was indeed someone waiting outside. I opened the door and saw a creepy, deranged man emitting distorted sounds as he gazed into the dark skies above. I didn't know what he wanted or if he was even all there. I genuinely felt disturbed, a feeling I hadn't felt in a long time. I didn't know what else to do other than to stare at him, saying, What do you want? He made such odd sounds and then suddenly said, My name's Ash. What's your name? 
I replied, saying, It's none of your business. Now get the hell out of here. Infuriated, I slammed the door on him, only to be prevented by the strange man who stuck his foot out as he moaned, his eyes wandering into space like a zombie. If he expected to freak me out, it was definitely working, because it was evident that I wasn't going to overpower this guy, nor stop him from entering inside. So I stood up to him and dared. If you're gonna kill me, just do it already. The man lifted his hand to shake mine as he said, My name's Ash. What's your name? If I tell you, will you leave me alone? I asked hoping he would take the bait. However, he remained spaced out as he constantly groaned, so I decided to give the man what he wanted, hoping he'd leave me alone after this. My name is Wednesday, I said. I couldn't read his mind no matter how hard I tried. I didn't know if this guy wanted to hurt me or not, but I knew I had to shake his hand in order to get him to leave. I examined him thoroughly, cautiously lifting my hand to shake his. Then, when our hands finally made contact, he clasped it tightly, yanking me toward him. What's wrong with you? Let go of me! Heedless of my rants, his eyes rolled back toward the back of his head, and then he said, You have no idea how long I waited for this day to come! The man then started to squeeze my hand tighter, crushing it with his vice grip. I wailed, thinking I was about to witness my hand get squished in front of me. I tried jerking my hand free, but it only made his grip tighter. As I felt my hand disintegrate before me, the man said, So, where is it? I don't know what you're talking about. Please just let me go. I said in desperation. I wasn't born yesterday, Wednesday. Give it to me! He frantically replied, having lost all sense of reason. I thought of what it might be that he was looking for, but I was so focused on surviving that nothing significant came to mind. I tried to break free, kicking and scratching at the man, but nothing worked. He then raised my hand towards his face and it against his face, constantly sniffing it like an animal. Then, a few moments later, something strange happened. One of the creep's hands detached from his body, falling to the ground like a prosthetic. It was the perfect opportunity to escape, so that's what I did. I freed myself from his grasp and then slammed the door shut and locked Locking it, completely shocked by what had happened. From outside, I could hear the man hollering, Come on! I just want my hand back! And when he finally gave up, he fled the property while I remained in awe, unable to believe what I had just heard. Moments later, the thing gingerly approached me, reminding me how everything about it was a mystery even before I was born. Could it be? I pondered. My eyes focused on the walking hand, and that's when I speculated that the thing might be related to this enigmatic stranger who suddenly appeared out of the blue at our doorstep. Knowing how my parents love to keep secrets, it wasn't impossible that the thing belonged to this man. So I crouched down and grabbed the hand, asking it. Tell me, Thing, do you know that man? The Thing couldn't speak. After all, it was only a hand. However, its agitated muscles told me everything. It was stiff and tense, making me wonder if my parents knew about its past, holding it captive for reasons I have yet to discover. This happened to me a few years ago, back when I was in high school. I remember taking a class that my friends were taking. I don't remember exactly what the course was, but it was some kind of history or geography class. Again, I didn't care about the work the class entailed. I was only in it because of the big international field trip that the class got to go on at the end of the year. Everyone who took it the year before said it was fun, but only a handful of students were actually accepted into the course. To my surprise, I was able to get on the roster with a good friend of mine at the time, who we'll call Bob. Everyone else in the class was pretty cool too, except for this one weird emo goth girl who sat in the back and gave everybody the creeps. I don't even remember her name, but I think the name Wednesday would suit her pretty well. She didn't like anybody, and nobody liked her either. She just sat in the back of the class and talked to herself, if she said anything at all. I could always feel her watching me from the back row. A part of me wondered what sick, twisted things she was thinking about, but for the whole year, she didn't actually do anything crazy. That was until the last few weeks of school, when the class finally got to go on the big trip. 
The trip was a resort located in Brazil. I remember wanting to sit with my buddy Bob on the plane, but by then, he was preoccupied with this other girl he had a crush on, abandoning me to sit with her, and as fate would have it, I was stuck sitting next to Wednesday. We ignored each other for a while. I just quietly greeted her and minded my own business while she kept her eyes facing straight forward, almost like a statue. After a while, I decided to make some small talk. Ever flown on a plane before? There wasn't a trace of reaction on her face. It was like I was talking to a ghost. They could give us a little more legroom, don't you think? <laughs> Aren't you excited about the trip? Finally, it looked like she might talk to me for a second, as she slowly twisted her neck around to face me without moving the rest of her body. Then, suddenly, her gaunt expressionless face transformed into something inhuman as she opened her mouth wide, looking like a demon. <laughs> A moment later, I jumped awake in the middle of the dark and quiet plane, realizing my whole attempt to talk to Wednesday was just a nightmare. Everybody was asleep, but afterwards I stayed awake for the rest of the flight. Several hours later, we finally got off the plane. Then, the trip got off to a good start as we hit the first few stops before settling into where we were staying. There were a few more hours of daylight left before we all took the opportunity to unwind at the nearby lake that was popular for swimming. However, before the guides let us swim, they pointed out an area on the far side of the lake where there was a dock that was home to a swarm of piranhas. We were told they were ambush predators and wouldn't mess with us if we didn't go near them. It freaked us out a little bit, but it didn't stop us from swimming. The only person who was square enough not to join us was Wednesday, of course. A little while went on and we had our fun playing in the water until we all got tired. Some of us got out, but Bob and I and a few others stayed in the water. There was a point in that time where I was relaxing close to the dock. That's when I heard something from a distance. It was someone trying to get my attention. I opened my eyes and saw Wednesday standing at the far side of the dock waving at me to come over. I hadn't even realized how close I'd gotten to the piranha dock, but honestly, I was more scared of her. I had already made eye contact with her, so I felt like it was too obvious to flat out ignore her, but I took my chances and glared at the opposite direction. Again, I could hear Wednesday calling out for me, and that's when I started hearing footsteps creaking along the wooden planks, like she was walking towards me. The sound was getting closer, so in that moment, I knew I had to get the hell out of there. I casually swam away while avoiding any eye contact with her. Then, as I got a little farther, I quickly got out to the nearest shore and hurried into a porter potty just to get out of being around Wednesday for another minute. I was only hiding in there for a couple of minutes when I heard a big splash, like someone just cannonballed into the lake. But what made my heart sink was hearing the awful screaming that came right after. I knew immediately it was Bob. I jumped out and sprinted over to the dock. I remember seeing Wednesday standing on the edge of the dock, looking down at Bob fighting for his life in the piranha-infested water. Then, she looked over at me and cracked the most sadistic smug smile that made my blood boil. But I didn't care. I ran down to the dock and went straight past her and laid down on the edge reaching my hand down in front of Bob's flailing arms, but it was like the water was boiling with blood with the number of piranhas that were attacking him. Bob, Bob, take my hand, come on! Finally, he took a hold of my hand, and I pulled him out of the water just in time. Thankfully, even though he got cut up all over his body, he got away without any serious lacerations. Of course, things could have been a lot worse if I wasn't there on time. Bob accused Wednesday of tricking him into coming over and pushing him into the water. But since then, Wednesday has denied the allegations and never admitted to what she did. Till this day, I know she's a dirty liar. I'll believe my friend over a creep like that no matter what. Still, it really freaks me out to know that she tried to get me initially. This story was inspired by a scene in the hit Netflix show Wednesday, where Wednesday dumps two full bags of piranhas into a pool filled with male students. There has been an abundance of reported piranha attacks that occur within multiple lakes in Brazil. We figured we'd base this Wednesday special, inspired by the deadly occurrences going on down there. 
Look at her! She's like a rotting tomato! Can we grind her up into a paste and serve her on spaghetti? That's not a bad idea now, my little Pugsley. But do contain yourself. Your father is not done teaching your sister a valuable lesson about what it means to be part of this family. That's exactly right.